Colts Nation, so optimism season is still very much upon us, and as we inch closer to training camp, I've been thinking about what else we could talk about other than this rookie class. I mean, we're not too far removed from it, and we're all very excited about it, but I did start thinking a bit about the rest of the roster, as it feels that many of Colts Nation has as well, and some of the other content creators in this space, right? Now, I've been on record in recent weeks talking about the possibility of the Colts competing for a wild card in this upcoming season. And now I don't view that as a crazy take, but following a 4-12-1 season, there's no question that some things need to go our way and some guys really need to make an impact for us, for us to deliver on those type of expectations, right? And I don't want this to be confused with an episode that is kind of talking about breakout candidates and players that can have a really big season, like fantasy, all that stuff, right? Is is not that. This episode is far more about responsibility than it is untapped potential. And I know that sometimes could kind of go hand in hand, but for today, I'm talking about dudes that I'm looking at and, you know, I really need them to step up, right? You see, ideally a team, right? There's a 53-man roster of guys and, and the coach speak, the GM speak would be, you need 53 guys that are ready to step up and play when their number is called. But the reality is that the average NFL lifespan is what, three years? Am I making that number up or is that the real number? And that includes all the dudes that have 5, 10, 15 year careers in this league, right? So the fact of the matter, the truth of it, is that you're really going to be relying on a core set of dudes in your organization if things are going well, and then kind of having this carousel of dudes come out around them, right? So today I want to talk about some of those players that I'm looking at on this roster that I feel really need to be the drivers of some change, some production, and I guess guys that I'm going to be holding more accountable as the season unfolds. And I've got five of them right now. This doesn't mean that these are the only guys, right? And this list can be variable maybe as time goes on. But these are the guys I have on my mind right now. So let's dive right into it. Uh, well, really, before we dive into it, if you've never been here before, welcome. My name is Justin. This is the Ride the Bench Colts cast. I'm recording from my bedroom with a little bit of bed head. One thing I ask from you, if at any point during this video you're enjoying it, if you could just go ahead and bloop, shoot the video a like, it would do a great service to me, one, to let me know that I'm doing well and so I can improve, but two, to let you know what goes in front of your face as you go across the platform. And then I guess three as well, is it helps me get out to as many people as possible. If you've already done that a million times and you want to keep following the journey, you can totally subscribe too. I'd be very, very grateful for that. But ultimately for me, uh, this is just about making content for Colts fans to enjoy. So if you don't subscribe today, no pressure. I understand you ain't got many people in your rotation. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to be with me today. So let's talk about player number one that I'm looking at, and that is the cover boy. You click this video, you saw him, Quentin Nelson, right? Now, let me just preface all of this by saying I love Quentin Nelson. In fact, as I talk about all these players, I love all of these players right here, right? But this is an offensive line now for, what is this, two straight seasons, three straight seasons? I'm going very much off the top of my head that we have viewed as a unit that has underachieved, right? I mean, every single season, it feels like we go in touted as one of the best offensive lines is football in football. And for a very long time, this was true. And even in Jonathan Taylor's amazing MVP caliber season, and in my opinion, he just won the MVP. Don't ask me who actually won it. That was Jonathan Taylor's MVP season. The line was spectacular on that front, but in pass protection, we were a little bit shoddy, right? And this is a unit that has a lot of talent for us to even be having the discussion about them underachieving and moving guys like Ryan Kelly. I mean, right, you start at right tackle with Braden Smith, right guard we don't have figured out. You have Ryan Kelly, you have Quentin Nelson, and you have this young kid Raymond on the left side here, right? And let me pull out a little analogy, right? Because Quentin Nelson, without question, is the best player on this offensive line. And that's just not Colts fans speaking. That's not just the locker room. I would assume if you ask them who that dude is up front, it would be him. But outside looking in, I mean, Quentin Nelson is one of the most widely known Colts in, in the world, really. And he's a guard, right? So why am I looking at the best player already on this offensive line as someone that needs to step up? I'm going to tell you, again, with an analogy. 
the CEO of Google, mind you, I'm not trying to get like, you know, business, I don't even know who the CEO of Google is, right? But the CEO of Google, right? And, and follow me here. Let's say this dude lives in California. Now, CEO is a billion dollar company, a bajillion dollar company, right? They've got branches all over the country, different departments, right? Different middle managers in charge of these types of things, correct? Despite living in uh, California, hypothetically, the CEO, if something goes down at the Florida branch that makes national news, who is it that answers to that? Tell me. It's the CEO that lives in California, despite the fact that it has nothing to do with him, right? So Quentin Nelson, for me, is like the CEO of this offensive line, right? If we underachieve, I'm looking at him. What he may not realize, and I watch press conferences and things of that nature. He has some media availability. We don't get a lot of Quentin Nelson talking as Colts fans, right? When we do, we absorb it. We try to take everything we can from it. One thing, and I don't mean to attack him as a person. I hope it doesn't come off that way. This guy comes off really lackadaisical, really like no energy, boring type of dude, right? And there's not technically anything wrong with that, but whether Quentin Nelson realizes it or not, this offense basically runs through him. I mean, the energy that he brings on a Sunday is going to have a ripple effect throughout not just the offensive line unit, but this entire team. So when we look back at a season like last season, we're asking ourselves, where is the pride in this unit? You guys are so good. How do you underachieve like this? For me, I'm looking at Quentin Nelson and saying, hey, dude, not for anything. You're great. We know that. Everyone knows you're that dude. But it's time for you to hold these other guys accountable week in and week out, whether that's leading by example or leading with your jaw, yapping, chirping, whatever it is, man, this offensive line, I'm looking at Quentin Nelson. So that's why I said him as opposed to maybe someone like a Ryan Kelly who, who's had a rough stretch and things like that. I called out the best dude on the offensive line and said, hey, listen, man, no matter what happens here, no matter whose fault it is, as we nurture this left tackle, I'm looking at you. You're next to him. As Ryan Kelly struggles, I'm looking at you. You're next. I'm looking at Quentin Nelson, whether that's fair or not. That's player number one. Player number two, and really this is two players, but I view them as a unit right now, uh, and I'll explain why. I'm looking at Quiddy Pay, and I'm looking at Dylan Dangbo right now. Our defensive line, a lot of people talk about this pass rush. I know it took an extra game last season. That was one of the all-time great pass rushing units by the numbers that we had last year, right? And you got Grover Stewart. And DeForest Buckner, two dogs. I think probably as a tandem, maybe the most underrated unit in, in the entire league, right? And we had Yannick Ngakwe last season, who we let walk. I'm not even sure if we offered him. I felt like there was never even a question as to whether or not we were going to bring back Yannick Ngakwe, right? And we let him go. And we have these two guys right here. We brought in Samson Ebukam. But you have Quiddy Pay we invested a first round pick into he's one of these guys that kind of like what we did in this draft this was a tools guy this was long arm strong fast athletic right and then we have dialing dangbo who i know all too well coming off a torn achilles injury last season uh, which i'm dealing with right now peep the crutches in the back right so i understand that this is something that takes a while to come back from and quitty pay dealing with these injuries as well right but when you let a guy like yannick Ngakwe go ultimately the fans only care so much, whether you like this or not, we only care so much about your injuries, right? We really do. I mean, we look at guys tear their ACLs every single week and think nothing of it. That's like a catastrophic injury, right? But at the end of the day, you have people paying to show up. You have people sacrificing their time on Sunday to watch you, right? While you get paid lots of money. And I ain't hating on no one for making money, baby. I love that about this, uh, about this country. Digression. But regardless, I ain't hating on you for making money. What I'm saying is with that money and with representing this team comes a level of responsibility. Injury aside, it is clear that this organization has put trust in these two and is counting on at least one of these two to step up huge this year and become a real pass rusher or just a real menace for us, right? Quiddy Pay and Dio and Dengbo, I'm watching now because we're kind of into these rookie contracts. What is this, Quiddy's third year? Is it his fourth, right? I mean, I love his potential and I like listening to him speak. I think he's a high character dude. Injuries have kind of gotten in the way a little bit, but for me, I'm looking at these two and saying, guys, all the excuses aside, this is a put up or shut up year for you guys. We're relying on you. You've got great talent next to you. You've got a great, one of the great defensive coaches really in the past 10, 15 years in Gus Bradley, right? I mean, we've got 
the tools. We've got the pieces in place for you two to succeed. Robert Mathis, not only a great defensive lineman, a great pass rusher for this team. He knows what it's like to be a great Colt, right? That means something to him. It's not just about being a great player. It's about being a great Colt. And Quiddy and Dial, you guys have a chance this year to really ingratiate yourself into this city and this community and really make an impact for this team, right? So I'm looking at Quiddy and Dial, if I haven't said it enough times. Now we go to player number three. And oh boy, I didn't want to put this guy down here because I think he gets way too hard of a time from all of you, right? But, or many of you rather, Michael Pittman Jr. Now, I think Michael Pittman Jr. has done plenty well with what's been asked of him. I think realistically, everyone says, oh, he's not a wide receiver one. He's not a wide, I don't even know what that means, right? What does it mean to be a wide receiver one? Does it just simply mean being one of the top 12 wide receivers in football? Because if that's the case, there's a lot of great receivers that aren't a wide receiver one. Michael Pittman is so good that even if he's not one of those top 12, if you put him next to any one of those top 12, he would immediately become one of the top wide receiver twos in football. Like he would immediately turn that core into one of the best in the league if he was their second best receiver, right? I mean, he's that good. He's that special. That being said, this is another room we've looked at as one that needed to step up. And I think as the season went on last year, they got a little bit better just off of my memory. But when you look at the beginning of the season, we were talking about separation. We were talking about tenacity, right? We were talking about how bad do these guys want it? Or at least I felt that a little bit. It kind of just, we had that feel last season as a team, right? Quickly in this league, you go from the young guy to the veteran, right? Garner Minshew is a good example of this. Garner Minshew, not too long ago, was this sensationalized rookie out of Jacksonville uh, who was drafted in like the sixth round, all of a sudden he's a veteran quickly. He's still very, very young himself and has plenty to learn, I'm sure, in this league. He's already a veteran looking at a younger guy, right? Pittman, despite the fact that he's still on his rookie contract, going into his contract season, right? Payday is on the line. He's like the youngest dude in the locker room, or rather the oldest dude in the locker room. You're looking at guys like Alec Pierce, Josh Downs, Strawn, okay, Isaiah McKenzie, I must have missed there. Point being is Michael Pittman is widely regarded, I'm sure, within that locker room, but amongst us as the best receiver we've got. And it's time for Michael Pittman to now take the production that we have seen and for him to take over this locker room and hold these dudes accountable and say, hey, we've got to be better every single week. I view this as Michael Pittman. This is very similar to what I was saying about Quentin Nelson before. We know you're that guy. We like you as a player. We love you as a player, right? I mean, Michael Pittman's got to be one of my favorite players on the team. But my brother, it's time now. We're looking at you to become a leader, not just for that unit, but for this team. That's a big theme in this episode. After a season like we had last year, we need guys to step up and say, hey, enough is enough. We're the Indianapolis Colts, right? And maybe once upon a time, this was a trash organization. But when you talk about the 2000s, this is a team that has had pride and we have won games and we have always been competitive. We may not be the Patriots dynasty, or what the Chiefs have going on, right? But the Colts were always one of the top teams in the AFC in the 2000s and always a team that was viewed that way. Even in recent years, last year, people were looking at us as a team that was a dark horse to maybe represent the AFC or make the AFC championship in the preseason. I know it may not feel that way now, but that's what was going on. And in part, it was due to having guys like Michael Pittman. And they let us down, right? It wasn't just Matt Ryan as much as we all fucking like to talk about it. It was guys like Pittman. It was this receiver room. It was some of these guys that we view as the bigger talents on this team not holding up a standard of excellence here, right? And that's something that needs to happen. And it doesn't just start with the coaching staff. It starts with these players. And in the wide receiver room, for me, it starts with Michael Pittman Jr. I'm looking at Michael Pittman Jr., especially when the money is on the line, baby. If you can't show that you're that alpha, that dog this year, if you're not that guy, we're going to find out this year, Michael Pittman. And I certainly am rooting for you and believe in you. But nonetheless, that's where I'm at. Now, player number four, right? I'm on four. Okay. And this one's tough because I've talked about guys that have been on the team. This is the first rookie I'm bringing up. And this is just the harsh reality of the situation. Julius Brents. Julius Brents is in a very tough spot this year. This is a local kid. Grew up with his favorite player being Bob Sanders now expected to become the starting outside corner, right? Built in that Gus Bradley mold. I mean, there's a lot of hype around him now, and he's replacing in many ways, not maybe directly, but Stephon Gilmore is no longer on this team, and we've drafted this kid Julius Brents, and you look at this room of corners. You have Julius Brents, 
You have Kenny Moore, who's a leader, who we love, right? You have Isaiah Rogers, who I think cont continues to be one of the most underrated players on the defensive side of the ball in this league. This kid's a playmaker. Can't wait to see what he does this year. And then you have dudes like, you know, Darius Rush. And honestly, you hate to be this way. Dallas Flowers made a great impact on special teams. Hey, Tony Brown, I'm just, is that his name? I mean, there's some guys here, right, that, uh, you know, we're going to have to see what they do, right? I'm optimistic, of course. Optimism season. We're right in it. But Julius Brents is a dude that on day one, Juju Brents, I know it's his nickname is what I've been told. Juju Brents needs to step up and be a big player on the outside. And now tough, I know, because normally we don't like to place that type of emphasis on a rookie. But for this defense to succeed this year, to succeed, Julius Brents is going to have to have stretches where he's a lockdown corner. I'm not saying he has to be Darrell Revis. I'm not saying he has to be Sauce. Gar Look at me, by the way, mentioning two Jets when I'm talking about greatness. I'm not saying he has to be Richard Sherman. I'm not saying he has to be, you know, whoever, Darius Slay. This, that, the next. But Julius Brents can't look like a rookie. He's going to have to play beyond his years to start the season. And Julius, I'm sorry to put this type of juju. I'm sorry to put this type of pressure on you, buddy. But I'm looking at you this year. Um, and I'll probably, let, realistically, I'll probably let Juju off the hook if he struggles, all things considered. But that being said, if we're talking about this in the context of success this season, Juju Brents is without a doubt somebody that has to step up for this defense to reach his potential this year. Now, number five, final player before we wrap this thing up, I'm looking at Julian Blackman, right? And Julian Blackman, we already know, is spectacular. Another guy that falls into this Michael Pittman basket, this Quentin Nelson basket, in terms of guys I was talking about this episode. This room of safeties is very, very young. And they were young last year, too, right? But we had a guy like Rodney McLeod. That was the thing about this defense last year. We had these veteran leaders, right? We had, not that we don't now per se, but in the secondary, we had a few more. We had Stephon Gilmore, right, who knew what it was like to be great, has been around great teams, right, oh, those Patriots years and so on and so forth. Rodney McLeod had put some great years in for the Eagles, and he had come here, and he's someone I risk, wish we retained, but we didn't. So now we're in this situation where we have Julian Blackman leading a room of young safeties and Nick Cross, whose talent I love, Rodney Thomas, who, if you didn't see his interview, Bring the Juice, very cool to listen to him talk. Always happy to see that type of thing. Would love to talk to a Colts player myself one day. Perhaps after this episode, they won't want to talk to me, right? But Rodney Thomas, obviously good work, but we don't know fully what that's going to be yet. And uh, who is uh, Daniel Scott, right? Point being is that the safety room is young, and the safety room needs someone to step up and be a leader. And again, as I was saying before, I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot this episode. Very quickly in this league, do you go from being the young, hungry, rookie, learning from a veteran, need a mentor, to being the guy that has to give back to the younger dudes? And many times it might be before you're ready to do that, right? And Julian Blackman finds himself potentially in that spot. This is the unquestioned best safety that we have. But ultimately, we look at this secondary and we say, hey, we're a little worried here. If there's one unit I'm worried about this season, it's the secondary for sure. Full disclosure. So I'm looking at these guys now to prove me wrong because I think they can and I believe in their talent. And it's why I put them in here. I put them in this, not that they'll see it. Very unlikely that any of these guys see this video. I understand that. I have no delusion about the size of the channel. But I put them in here, I suppose, just on a personal level to say, hey, I know how good you guys can be. But for us to be as good as we can be as a team, it's on you. So Julian Blackman, you're someone that needs to step up and just like Julius Brents needs to play a bit beyond your years this season, at least as a leader, right? And really as a player. I mean, we need production out of Julian Blackman this season. No questions asked, right? So that right there was five players that I view that need to, I don't know, step up for us this year, make an impact. These are guys that I'm looking at to rally the troops this year. And I kind of view a lot of what we do running through the success of some of these guys this year, at least as it currently stands. That things may change throughout training camp, uh, but that's that, right? So congratulations. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, hopefully I didn't have an angry talk throughout this episode. I don't know if I did. I don't know if I did. I'm just so passionate about this Colts team. And if you're as passionate about the Colts as I am, you haven't shot the video a like yet, you made it here. You didn't hate it, I assume, right? Unless you're just making fun of me the whole time, right? So if you could shoot the video a like at this point, it would be greatly appreciated. And if you want to, uh, you know, know what I'm releasing in the future, 
I'll be here every single week for the rest of my life. That's just the truth of the matter. I don't just say that as like a meme or something. I mean that. Like, I will never stop talking about the Colts on this YouTube channel uh, for as long as I live, right? So you can go ahead and shoot a subscribe if you want to be a part of that journey. The ups, the downs, the growth, and, and, and the tough times, right? That's what that's for. If you've already done both of those things, I'm going to put out the hugest ask ever. If you just shared this show with one other person that you know loves the Colts as much as me, as much as you, that would be spectacular. Marvelous, right? That would be an amazing thing. But I understand. You don't want to be the dork bringing that up, right? I, this I understand. So if you do that, great. If not, I really just hope you enjoyed the episode. And I hope you join me next time. I'll probably actually have one of these out tomorrow, barring any unforeseen circumstances. What I'll be talking about, I don't know. I'll figure it out. Uh, but until next time, my name is Justin. This is the Ride the Bench Colts cast. Thank you so much for joining me. Go Colts.